Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. It was either January or March of 2013, depending on whose definition, when Israel's Air Force struck a target deep inside Syria with no response from Damascus. This turned out to be the quiet start of the, what is called today in Israel, the campaign between the war with the Hebrew acronym Mabam. Following hundreds of sorties, including near-weekly strikes against Iranian operatives and proxies, as well as the Islamic State targets, it is time to take stock and ask whether Mabam was a success story, is Israel better off for it, and is it about to outlive its usefulness? Joining us to discuss it from central Israel is Major General in Reserve Gil Shona Cohen, who is an IDF Army Corps commander. Thank you for joining us, General. Good evening. Thank you. Joining us uh, also here in the studio is Colonel in Reserve of Enman Shalom, who is a cross-cultural strategist as well as a panelist of TV7 Spires in Play, uh, as well as uh, uh, other programs and a long-time or frequent panelist here on the Jerusalem studio as well. Thank you for joining us as well, Colonel, and of course our TV7 editor-at-large, uh, Amir Oren, a host of Watchmen uh, Talks, Spires in Play, and so much more. Uh, Amir, give us a broader understanding uh, on... Mabam, the campaign between the wars, to what degree has this ultimately brought about the desired outcome of its initiators? So it all started 20 years ago, uh, 10 years before the date you cited, when Israel struck a Palestinian camp in uh, Syria and Bashar Assad threatened that the next time Israel does it, he will respond in kind. Uh, probably launching missiles rather than, rather than uh, uh, airplanes. So for several years, except for the nuclear reactor, Israel refrained from doing it. But when the Iranian militias and proxies started entrenching themselves in Syria, Israel decided to, for the first time, again, do it. And there are two principles. One doing it without provoking a war. That is, uh, operations short of war and short of provoking the other side to start a war. And the other principle is that while you are doing it, you are degrading the other side's power should a war start. And for hundreds of sorties, against uh, both the Syrians, Iranians, and Daesh, ISIS, Israel managed to do it. And the proof is that no war um, has erupted over that uh, decade. Indeed. Well, uh, as uh, General uh, Cohen mentioned, uh, the area of uh, the strike, of course, you were operational uh, uh, at the time uh, in areas relevant to that. Uh, General, to what degree do you look today at the Mabam, at the campaign between the wars, and uh, you see the uh, fruits of, of these activities uh, with regard to ultimately bringing about uh, or asserting Jerusalem's red lines, and that is to thwart Iranian entrenchment in Syria and uh, also prevent it from smuggling both dumb missiles but also precision-guided munitions to its proxies uh, on Israel's northern front, particularly also through Syria and to Lebanon, where Hezbollah is uh, threatening Israel, quite literally. Yes, what you just emphasized is actually the explicit main purpose of this campaign uh, to prevent the Iranian effort to build a new front in the Golan Heights against Israel, including with Hezbollah uh, commanders and uh, troops. Regarding the uh, outcome, just examining what happened in the last 10 years, the Israeli uh, campaign could be exemplified as a, a, a success because actually the Iranian have been really prevented. But there are other outcomes, and really we must uh, look with reflection, with critical reflection about the achievement, uh, whether at all in long range uh, the purpose could at all be achieved. But if we are not looking about other implicit purposes, then we are just looking only about the 
definite purpose, but there are other purposes not less important. I can uh, just explain them later. I think it is better to go ahead about the discussion, but before ending, I just emphasize that what really was achieved is a kind of manifestation of intelligence superiority and operational uh, uh, relevance of the Israeli uh, Air Force to really attack very, very definite uh, targets. And this in itself is a kind of an expression. Indeed, of course, uh, not only aerial superiority for that matter, since uh, at the start of this week we had a reminder of uh, the senior uh, engineering uh, operative of Palestinian Islamic Jihad being uh, assassinated early in the morning uh, by uh, uh, agents allegedly uh, related to Israel's intelligence branches. Uh, of course, uh, this was unconfirmed uh, here in Jerusalem. But Colonel uh, Ben Shalom, when we're talking about uh, the capacity to um, persevere, uh, and I'm talking particularly on the Iranian perseverance also vis-a-vis -vis Israel, considering the fact that I just went through my notes over the course since 2014, there were hundreds of militants uh, uh, loyal to the Iranians who were killed uh, in those various operations attributed to Israel. Israel, of course, in most cases, uh, did not claim any responsibility and, and highlighted time and again that it does not confirm nor deny uh, its uh, responsibility. Nonetheless, we see the Iranians persistent, continuing no matter what and willing to do everything in its power to achieve its goals. Of course, we have also the Russians, which we'll touch on later, but I'd like to hear your perspective on this. Can I give a classic answer, um, being a student of General Hakohen? And a pilot, among others, indeed. As a student of General Hakohen, I would say that we perceive ourselves as to be very determined, right? We have a vision, we have a long-term goal, we're determined, we're resilient. We don't fear war, right? We have a long uh, goal, which is to sustain our homeland here in Israel. The Iranians are also very persistent, and they have goals, and they are not gonna shy away from their goals just because we attacked several of their targets. So also when we go to this campaign, and we had to do it, I think was a very smart move, I don't think we imagined that the Iranians would, after 10 strikes, would say, you know what, Israel is too much for us. We're going to change our goals. We're going to get out of here. That do doesn't work that way. So even <laughs> here, it's very important. Did I get this right, Gershon? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, so, so we have to see it that way. We're talking about rivals with strategic objectives, and they're going to continue with their objectives, and we will with ours. The big mistake that we corrected, that in the past many times, too many times, we wanted quiet. Sometimes we even defined our goal as quiet, and we waited for uh, threats to accumulate, and then it hit us full force during the war. Here we said in a way, we will not let that happen again. We will thwart, we will negate each and every strategic munition that comes online. Not everything, not all at once, but when something that we defined, red lines, we will take that out. So I don't think we can say that we wanted to make the Iranians not entrench in Syria, because they are entrenching. It's that we decided we're always going to be relevant and we're always going to shape and try to push the war farther away. And when it does erupt, at least we took out the capabilities that we do not want to see during the war. Mr. Oren, I, of course, also mentioned the Russians in this story. Well, the Russians uh, are an important input into it. But the overall envelope is the uh, idea that there are no total wars anymore. And therefore, there are no total campaigns. All campaigns are limited in the means chosen, in the objectives chosen, in duration, in effect. And um, we should recognize that what looked like a successful raid one week, the next week uh, could change. And uh, the price that uh, Israel is willing to pay in uh, materiel, in manpower, in domestic support, in international legitimacy, should be kept very limited because tomorrow is another day. Indeed. And the Russians, of course, uh, twice um, had, have uh, impacted on it. In 2015, when they entered following the Turkish 
skirmish with them. And then in 2017, when the Syrians shot down one of their own planes following an Israeli raid, which is the law of unintended consequences. So we should always be careful because there will be another mission and better to abort a mission you're not certain of the results of rather than go ahead and get involved in, uh, in some real problem. I think it's also very interesting to see the Russian aspect to this uh, matter, considering the fact that even though today we see bolstered relations between Moscow and Tehran and all the matters of uh, strategic understanding and, and uh, aligned perspectives vis-a-vis -vis the West at least, uh, it's not always the case in Syria. They're allowing Israel basically to do their dirty work in trying to mitigate Iranian influence in Damascus by weakening uh, basically the Islamic Republic in Syria. Well, th that's perhaps too conspiratorial. They are dif indifferent to what Israel is doing to the Iranians. They don't really care, and they don't have enough resources to go in the Ukraine and in Syria. So as long as it doesn't infringe on their own problems, on their own resources, they don't really care what the Turks do, what the Americans do, and what the Israelis are doing. Even though it, uh, the uh, coordination mechanism or the deconfliction mechanism started in 2014, uh, immediately following the entry of Russia into but, the But, story. you know, uh, talking with people who took part in this uh, channel, the Russians do not listen. They try to dictate. In the, in the meetings with them, they give their positions... And that's it. Indeed. Well, uh, I'd like to hear uh, General Cohen. Of course, uh, the the Russian consideration has altered Israel's diplomacy to a certain degree, considering uh, the fact that it's still withstanding some pressure from the West vis-a-vis -vis, uh, military support into uh, Ukraine. So, of course, the, the fact of the matter is uh, the Mabam or the campaign between the wars is uh, that important. Uh, to Israel and in its perspective to its uh, own security, considering the fact that the Iranians, as we highlighted, are very persistent in maintaining uh, their entrenchment and doing so at all costs almost. How do you see this um, actually continuing without a uh, miscalculation that may occur and may potentially even escalate uh, the situation into an all-out war? It could really happen, but... Before speaking about the risk that it will go beyond control, uh, here is a chance to elaborate about another function of this uh, campaign between the wars. The Israeli interest, even though it was not really uh, explicitly defined, was to take part in the friction in Syria in times that the Turks already operated inside Syria to uh, fulfill their interest, the same about the Americans in Tanaf, the same about the Iranians, and what the Israeli uh, raid, in a way, could succeed to achieve was to uh, emphasize that we are also, for the day after the civil war in Syria, part of the game. We are a player in that game because we are involved in the friction. So everyone must consider the Israeli interest in the day after. Even though it was not a kind of explicit uh, purpose, the very uh, fact that it brought the Russians to arrange what they called deconfliction with the Israelis, with the IDF. And it was a very effective channel of uh, coordination between the Russians and the IDF. It really made the Israeli interest part of the Syrian uh, players in the day after in the way in which uh, the new order is going to be emerged. 
Uh, with that being said, General, I'd like to ask you, ultimately we're seeing more and more, at least in the past several months, uh, statements coming out of Moscow, particularly actually from uh, the the research institutes that are related to the defense ministry as well as the foreign ministry, which has always been vocal uh, against Israeli activities in Syria, uh, regarding uh, their objection to Israeli activities in Syria. Uh, and it's becoming more vocal, of course, as time progresses. And just recently, and I'm talking about last week on, on Thursday, during a, a U.S. armed uh, committee Senate uh, hearing uh, in the United States, we heard CENTCOM commander Michael Carilla come out and say since, April, uh, excuse me, since March 1st, there's been a spike in altercations between Russia and the United States. Of course, uh, the United States being the greatest backer of, of the state of Israel, which Israel will always side by. To what degree is this then also a complication to this ongoing campaign between the wars? Absolutely correct, and uh, maybe uh, from our own side, from the IDF side and the Israeli uh, security defense uh, system, we quite neglected the meaning of the transformation of the Russians uh, regarding the whole interest and approach to the Israeli involvement in Syria due to the new relationship uh, and alliances between Iran and Russia in Ukraine. And also due to the fact that uh, Israel going more and more to be uh, directly involved in Ukraine, even yet not with supplying ammunition or uh, weapons, but we are already there, and the Russians, of course, changing the whole attitude against Israel. Indeed. Colonel uh, Ben Shalom, I'd like to hear your uh, take on this, but also China has been uh, an increasing influence in Syria. Of course, uh, a partner of, of Iran, a partner of Russia uh, in, in the context of uh, strategic competition, of course. Is this also a calculation in what's happening vis-a-vis -vis the, the Mabam? I think for Israel, uh, one of the big changes in the Mabam, and, and remember, we like to coin new names. It doesn't mean that we're actually doing something. Humans have all, always done this. But we coin a new name, and yeah, we did change the philosophy a bit. But one of the differences is that it's no longer a military campaign. It's much more than that. It's maybe more than ever a policy, uh, a strategy that gets interpreted and goes all the way down at the end to pushing a button and taking out a specific target. And maybe one of the best examples that we've seen in a long time. So it is taking broader considerations uh, if, as factors here. Sometimes I would even say that the, the trigger that's pulled is maybe even the less important thing here because the military will always want to take out another target and another target. The bank is big, okay? And, but the, but the, the policymakers have to take all these strategic calculations, a lot of diplomacy in the background. Our, our correlation now and communication with CENTCOM is critical. I think we many times talk about the Americans and CENTCOM as if we're just strategically aligned with them. It's much, much more than that. You see the exercises, you see the intel uh, exchange. I think of a lot of what we're doing is probably very closely coordinated with them actually promoting the same policy, just different aspects of it. So certainly China and the other big players are part of it. I would even say when you start talking about Mabam, you start talking about the big players, but I do not see, at least from what I see, I don't see China as a direct calculation that we have because no footprint, no direct uh, ramification as far as their involvement, just how the great powers play into this uh, arena. Mr. Owen? Um, one of the uh, great uh, successes of this campaign has been how inexpensive it was in casualties and therefore um, gained uh, public support. Because um, except for one F-16, which was uh, shot down by uh, a Syrian or Russian missile um, and its crew uh, ejected safely, um, no Israeli has been hurt uh, in, um, in that campaign for, for 10 years. Now it's uh, an astounding uh, success rate. And the, uh, what Israelis 
learn about uh, occasionally when a chief of staff retires and takes pride in what happened under his watch or an Air Force commander uh, does so to sum up his own four or five years at the helm. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There is an entire mechanism at the general staff, at the intelligence branch, at the Air Force, at Mossad and other places in the defense establishment, which works day and night in order for these raids to go through. Now, this is uh, also a good exercise for the uh, time when Israel would go to war. But uh, these um, senior officers and the other personnel are overworked. They are um, not tireless. They, they um, uh, are burned out by it. And this should also be a factor when uh, the government uh, authorizes or directs the military to carry out more raids. Indeed. Well, General Cohen, how do you see that? It was really the main uh, concentration of uh, chief of staff, uh, head of uh, intelligence, chief of intelligence, and all the uh, uh, intelligence officers that have been really directed to that uh, operation. Meanwhile, uh, the payment is that they, in a way, uh, lost time for paying attention to other responsibilities. And uh, beyond that, another risk that we must be aware of regarding the learning of the Russians and the Iranian is that uh, Step by step, they are uh, learning the Israeli superiority, and we must consider whether at all we are going ahead to use more uh, strikes like that, because part of our secrets are not any, any more secrets, and everything is known, and in the uh, competition of learning, the Iranian are really making a very, very good uh, job. The same about the Russians. Very interesting. Uh, Colonel Ben Shalom is an Air Force pilot in, in your past, of course, and uh, your other capacities. Ultimately, when you look at um, the doctrines being employed, obviously, and this is also what General Akoyan alludes to, um, we can't hide every methodology that uh, uh, is ultimately used within the battlefield, and, and the enemy is studying whatever is conducted on the battlefield, and, and something that, you know, when the, the time comes and, and a miscalculation occurs or uh, the war erupts in a different matter, potentially even from Lebanon or elsewhere, uh, to what degree is this consideration a factor? Well, first, uh, we used to, maybe 10 years ago, we thought of the Mabam as uh, brave fighter pilots crossing the border and taking out targets. I think that is no longer the case. Anyone that follows the way technology is going and even the things that Israel makes go to the IAI website or Rafael. You press a button, the target is destroyed. How is it destroyed? In multiple ways. We talk multi multi multi-dimensional war this now. This also includes cyber warfare. So I think it, we have to view this whole thing differently. So, and so doctrine change, technology change, and soon, by the way, it won't even be pilots at all because there's no reason to babysit a bomb to fly 100 miles and take out a target. The bomb flies by itself, does it by itself. Uh, as, as, far as, uh, as far as the doctrine and learning our doctrine, sometimes I even feel like I need to recommend to our enemies, make no mistake, this is not how we fight wars. We call it the campaign between the wars for a reason because during wartime, it, it's, it's something else. It's not... Uh, surgical, it's not pinpoint, it's not negating specific targets. The whole concept is different. It's overwhelming. The lever of devastation. We keep talking about Lebanon. In a way, warning Lebanon, please, you know, don't uh, escalate the situation. You don't want to be there. And I think this means a lot. Indeed. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like each and every one of you to give a closing uh, assessment, if you will. General Akoen, we'll start with you. Actually, the IDF and the Israeli security establishment must realize that we are in a time of uh, reconsider, a, a, an obligation to reconsider everything about uh, uh, the new steps because uh, things are really changing. 
and we must think about uh, whether we are coming to the point that we are exploiting the whole uh, system and must really make a kind of restart to a new game. Colonel Ben Shalom. I'm afraid that we got used too much to the campaign between the wars and these great successes and it's all quiet and no casualties. I think war will come and it troubles me when Israelis get used to the fact that we're so good. Our intelligence is so good. We can do it without paying a price. And I think ultimately there will be a regional war and we have to get used to it and prepare our own resilience for that. I, I think, and Mr. Owen, I'd like to hear your take on this. The fact of the matter is when the campaign between the war ends, the war starts. <laughs> What point oh, is that? Well, right. there are two, two points uh, uh, emanating from your uh, question. One is that the focus uh, may be entirely different. Uh, we all remember that in 1973, even in early October, Golda Meir, the prime minister, believed and expressed um, her idea that terrorism is much more of a danger to Israel than the military forces of Egypt and Syria. Uh, and it turned out that uh, she was very wrong. So perhaps Israel is now acting against a target it will not handle in wartime. Also, military success is a necessary condition, but not sufficient. The political echelon should exploit it. Indeed. Well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank General Gelson Akohen, Colonel Ruven Ben Shalom, and Mr. Amir Owen for being part of today's panel. And I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. And we will see you next time for yet another episode of TV7 Jerusalem Studio. Until then, Shalom. <laughs>